Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramhansa Yogananda. Chapter 44 with Mahatma Gandhi at Wardha. Welcome to Wardha. Mahadev Desai, secretary to Mahatma Gandhi, greeted Miss Bletch, Mr. Wright, and myself with these cordial words and the gift of wreaths of Khadar homespun cotton. Our little group had just dismounted at the Wardha station on an early morning in August, glad to leave the dust and heat of the train. Consigning our luggage to a bullock cart, we entered an open motor car with Mr. Desai and his companions. Baha Saheb, Deshmukh, and Dr. Pingali. A short drive over the muddy country roads brought us to Maganwadi, the ashram of India's political saint. Mr. Desai led us at once to the writing room where cross-legged sat Mahatma Gandhi. Pen in one hand and a scrap of paper in the other, on his face a vast, winning, warm-hearted smile. Welcome, he scribbled in Hindi. It was a Monday, his weekly day of silence. Though this was our first meeting, we beamed on each other affectionately. In 1925, Mahatma Gandhi had honored the Ranchi school by a visit, and had inscribed in its guest book, a gracious tribute. The tiny hundred-pound saint radiated physical, mental, and spiritual health. His soft brown eyes shone with intelligence, sincerity, and discrimination. This statesman has matched wits and emerged the victor in a thousand legal, social, and political battles. No other leader in the world has attained the secure niche in the hearts of his people that Gandhi occupies for India's unlettered millions. Their spontaneous tribute is his famous title, Mahatma, Great Soul. For them alone, Gandhi confines his attire to the widely cartooned loincloth, symbol of his oneness with the drown-trodden masses who can afford no more. The ashram residents are wholly at your disposal. Please call on them for any service. With characteristic courtesy, the Mahatma handed me this hastily written note as Mr. Desai led our party from the writing room toward the guest house. Our guide led us through orchards and flowering fields to a tile-roofed building with latticed windows. A front yard well, twenty-five feet across, was used, Mr. Desai said, for watering stock. Nearby stood a revolving cement wheel for threshing rice. Each of our small bedrooms proved to contain only the irreducible minimum, a bed, hand made of rope. The whitewashed kitchen boasted a faucet in one corner and a fire pit for cooking in another. Simple Arcadian sounds reached our ears, the cries of crows and sparrows, the lowing of cattle, and the rap of chisels being used to chip stones. Observing Mr. Wright's travel diary, Mr. Desai opened a page and wrote on it a list of Satyagraha vows taken by all the Mahatma's strict followers, or Satyagrahis, non-violence, truth, non-stealing, celibacy, non-possession, body labor, control of the palate, fearlessness, equal respect for all religions, swadeshi, the use of home manufactures, freedom from untouchability. These eleven should be observed as vows in a spirit of humility. Gandhi himself signed this page on the following day, giving the date also August 27th, 1935. Two hours after our arrival, my companions and I were summoned to lunch. The Mahatma was already seated under the arcade of the ashram porch, across the courtyard from his study. 
About twenty-five barefooted satyagrahis were squatting before brass cups and plates. A community chorus of prayer, then a meal served from large brass pots containing chapatis, whole wheat, unleavened bread, sprinkled with ghee, tilsari, boiled and diced vegetables, and a lemon jam. The Mahatma ate chapatis, boiled beets, some raw vegetables, and oranges. On the side of his plate was a large lump of very bitter neem leaves, a notable blood cleanser. With his spoon he separated a portion and placed it on my dish. I bolted it down with water, remembering childhood days when mother had forced me to swallow the disagreeable dose. Gandhi, however, bit by bit was eating the neem paste with as much relish as if it had been a delicious sweetmeat. In this trifling incident I noticed the Mahatma's ability to detach his mind from the senses at will. I recall the famous appendectomy performed on him some years ago. Refusing anesthetics, the saint had chatted cheerfully with his disciples throughout the operation, his infectious smile revealing his unawareness of pain. The afternoon brought an opportunity for a chat with Gandhi's noted disciple, daughter of an English admiral, Miss Madeline Slade, now called Mirabai. Her strong, calm face lit with enthusiasm as she told me, in flawless Hindi, of her daily activities. Rural construction work is rewarding. A group of us go every morning at five o'clock to serve the nearby villagers and teach them simple hygiene. We make it a point to clean their latrines and their mud-thatched huts. The villagers are illiterate. They cannot be educated except by example, she laughed gaily. I looked in admiration at this high-born English woman whose true Christian humility enables her to do the scavenging work usually performed only by so-called untouchables. I came to India in 1925, she told me. In this land I feel that I have come back home. Now I would never be willing to return to my old life and old interests. We discussed America for a while. I am always pleased and amazed, she said, to see the deep interest in spiritual subjects exhibited by the many Americans who visit India. Mirabai's hands were soon busy at the charka, spinning wheel, omnipresent in all the ashram rooms and, indeed due to the Mahatma, omnipresent throughout rural India. Gandhi has sound economic and cultural reasons for encouraging the revival of cottage industries, but he does not counsel a fanatical repudiation of all modern progress. Machinery, trains, automobiles, the telegraph have played important parts in his own colossal life. Fifty years of public service in prison and out, wrestling daily with practical details and harsh realities in the political world, have only increased his balance, open-mindedness, sanity, and humorous appreciation of the quaint human spectacle. Our trio enjoyed a six o'clock supper as guests of Baba Sahib Deshmukh. At 7 p.m. prayer hour found us back at the Maganvadi Ashram, climbing to the roof where thirty satyagrahis were grouped in a semicircle around Gandhi. He was squatting on a straw mat, an ancient pocket watch propped up before him. The fading sun cast a last gleam over the palms and banyans. The hum of night and the crickets had started. The atmosphere was serenity itself. I was enraptured. A solemn chant led by Mr. Desai, with responses from the group, then a Gita reading. The Mahatma motioned to me to give the concluding prayer. Such divine unison of thought and aspiration. A memory forever, the Wardha rooftop meditation under the early stars. Punctually at eight o'clock, Gandhi ended his silence. The Herculean labors of his life 
required him to apportion his time minutely. Welcome, Swamiji. The Mahatma's greeting this time was not by a paper. We had just descended from the roof to his writing room, simply furnished with square mats, no chairs, a low desk with books, papers, and a few ordinary pens, not fountain pens, a nondescript clock ticked in a corner, an all-pervasive aura of peace and devotion. Gandhi was bestowing one of his captivating, cavernous, almost toothless smiles. Years ago, he explained, I started my weekly observance of a day of silence as a means for gaining time to look after my correspondence. But now those twenty-four hours have become a vital spiritual need. A periodic decree of silence is not a torture, but a blessing. I agreed wholeheartedly. The Mahatma questioned me about America and Europe. We discussed India and world conditions. Mahadev, Gandhi said as Mr. Desai entered the room, please make arrangements at Town Hall for Swamiji to speak there on yoga tomorrow night. As I was bidding the Mahatma good night, he considerately handed me a bottle of citronetta oil. The Wadha mosquitoes don't know a thing about Ahimsa, Swamiji, he said, laughing. The following morning our little group breakfasted early on a tasty wheat porridge with molasses and milk. At 10.30 we were called to the ashram porch for lunch with Gandhi and the Satyagarahis. Today the menu included brown rice, a new selection of vegetables and cardamom seeds. Noon found me strolling about the ashram grounds on to the grazing land of a few imperturbable cows. The protection of cows is a passion with Gandhi. Quote, the cow to me means the entire subhuman world, extending man's sympathies beyond his own species, the Mahatma has explained. Man through the cow is enjoined to realize his identity with all that lives. Why the ancient rishis selected the cow for apotheosis is obvious to me. The cow in India was the best comparison. She was the giver of plenty. Not only did she give milk, but she also made agriculture possible. The cow is a poem of pity. One reads pity in the gentle animal. She is the second mother to millions of mankind. Protection of the cow means protection of the whole dumb creation of God. The appeal of the lower order of creation is all the more forceful because it is speechless. End quote. Three daily rituals are enjoined on the Orthodox Hindu. One is Bhuta Yagna, an offering of food to the animal kingdom. This ceremony symbolizes man's realization of his obligations to less evolved forms of creation. Instinctively tied to bodily identifications, which also corrode human life, but lacking in that ability of liberating reason, which is peculiar to humanity. Bhuta Yagna thus reinforces man's readiness to succor the weak, as he in turn is comforted by countless solicitudes of higher unseen beings. Man is also under bond for rejuvenating gifts of nature, prodigal in earth, sea, and sky. The evolutionary barrier of incommunicability among nature, animals, man, and astral angels is thus overcome by offices of silent love. The other two daily yagyas are Pitri and Nri. Pitri yagya is an offering of oblations to ancestors. As a symbol of man's acknowledgment of his debt to the past, essence of whose wisdom illumines humanity today. Nri Yagya is an offering of food to strangers or the poor, symbol of the present responsibilities of man, his duties to contemporaries. 
In the early afternoon, I fulfilled a neighborly niyagya by a visit to Gandhi's ashram for little girls. Mr. Wright accompanied me on the ten-minute drive. Tiny young flower-like faces atop the long-stemmed colorful saris. At the end of a brief talk in Hindi, which I was giving out of doors, the skies unloosed a sudden downpour. Laughing, Mr. Wright and I climbed aboard the car and sped back to Maganwadi, amidst sheets of driving silver, such tropical intensity and splash. Re-entering the guest house, I was struck anew by the stark simplicity and evidences of self-sacrifice which are everywhere present. The Gandhi vow of non-possession came early in his married life. Renouncing an extensive legal practice which had been yielding him an annual income of more than twenty thousand dollars, the Mahatma dispersed all his wealth to the poor. Sri Yukteswar used to poke gentle fun at the commonly inadequate conceptions of renunciation. A beggar cannot renounce wealth, Master would say. If a man laments, my business has failed, my wife has left me, I will renounce all and enter a monastery, to what worldly sacrifice is he referring? He did not renounce wealth and love, they renounced him. Saints, like Gandhi, on the other hand, have made not only tangible material sacrifices, but also the more difficult renunciation of selfish motive and private goal merging their innermost being in the stream of humanity as a whole. The Mahatma's remarkable wife, Kasturabai, did not object when he failed to set aside any part of his wealth for the use of herself and their children. Married in early youth, Gandhi and his wife took the vows of celibacy after the birth of several sons. A tranquil heroine in the intense drama that has been their life together. Kasturabai has followed her husband to prison, shared his three-week fasts, and fully borne her share of his endless responsibilities. She has paid Gandhi the following tribute, quote, I thank you for having had the privilege of being your lifelong companion and helpmate. I thank you for the most perfect marriage in the world, based on brahmacharya or self-control, and not on sex. I thank you for having considered me your equal in your life work for India. I thank you for not being one of those husbands who spend their time in gambling, racing, women, wine, and song, tiring of their wives and children as the little boy quickly tires of his childhood toys. How thankful I am that you are not one of those husbands who devote their time to growing rich on the exploitation of the labor of others. How thankful I am that you put God and country before bribes, that you had the courage of your convictions and a complete and implicit faith in God. How thankful I am for a husband who put God and his country before me. I am grateful to you for your tolerance of me and my shortcomings of youth when I grumbled and rebelled against the change you made in our mode of living from so much to so little. As a young child I lived in your parents' home. Your mother was a great and good woman. She trained me, taught me how to be a brave, courageous wife and how to keep the love and respect of her son my future husband. As the years passed and you became India's most beloved leader, I had none of the fears that beset the wife who may be cast aside when her husband has climbed the ladder of success, as so often happens in other countries. I knew that death would still find us husband and wife." For years, Kasturabai performed the duties of treasurer of the public funds, which the idolized Mahatma is able to raise by the millions. There are many humorous stories in Indian homes to the effect that husbands are nervous about their wives wearing any jewelry to a Gandhi meeting, 
the Mahatma's magical gift of tongue, pleading for the downtrodden, charms the gold bracelets and diamond necklaces right off the arms and necks of the wealthy into the collection basket. One day, the public treasurer, Kasturabai, could not account for a disbursement of four rupees. Gandhi duly published an auditing in which he inexorably pointed out his wife's four rupees discrepancy. I had often told this story before classes of my American students. One evening a woman in the hall had given an outraged gasp. Mahatma or no Mahatma, she had cried, if he were my husband, I would have given him a black eye for such an unnecessary public insult. After some good-humored banter that had passed between us on the subject of American wives and Hindu wives, I had gone on to a fuller explanation. Mrs. Gandhi considers the Mahatma not as her husband, but as her guru, one who has the right to discipline her for even insignificant errors, I had pointed out. Some time after Kasturabai had been publicly rebuked, Gandhi was sentenced to prison on a political charge. As he was calmly bidding farewell to his wife, she fell at his feet. Master, she said humbly, if I have ever offended you, please forgive me. At three o'clock that afternoon in Wardha, I betook myself by previous appointment to the writing-room of the saint who had been able to make an unflinching disciple out of his own wife. Rare miracle! Gandhi looked up with his unforgettable smile. Mahatmaji, I said, as I squatted beside him on the uncushioned mat, Please tell me your definition of ahimsa. The avoidance of harm to any living creature in thought or deed. A beautiful ideal, but the world will always ask, may one not kill a cobra to protect a child or oneself? I could not kill a cobra without violating two of my vows, fearlessness and non-killing. I would rather try inwardly to calm the snake by vibrations of love. I cannot possibly lower my standards to suit my circumstances. With his amazing candor, Gandhi added, I must confess that I could not carry on this conversation were I faced by a cobra. I remarked on several very recent Western books on diet which lay on his desk. Yes, diet is important in the Satyagraha movement, as everywhere else, he said with a chuckle. Because I advocate complete continence for Satyagrahis, I am always trying to find out the best diet for the celibate. One must conquer the palate before he can control the procreative instinct. Semi-starvation or unbalanced diets are not the answer. After overcoming the inward greed for food, a Satyagrahi must continue to follow a rational vegetarian diet with all necessary vitamins, minerals, calories, and so forth. By inward and outward wisdom in regard to eating, the Satyagrahi's sexual fluid is easily turned into vital energy for the whole body. The Mahatma and I compared our knowledge of good meat substitutes the avocado is excellent, I said. There are numerous avocado groves near my center in California. Gandhi's face lit with interest. I wonder if they would grow in Wadha. The Satyagrahis would appreciate a new food. I will be sure to send some avocado plants from Los Angeles to Wadha. I added, eggs are a high-protein food. Are they forbidden to Satyagrahis? Not unfertilized eggs. The Mahatma laughed reminiscently. For years I would not countenance their use. Even now I personally do not eat them. One of my daughters-in-law was once dying of malnutrition. Her doctor insisted on eggs. I would not agree, and advised him to give her some egg substitute. Gandhiji, the doctor said, unfertilized eggs contain no life sperm. No killing is involved. I then gladly gave permission for my daughter-in-law to eat eggs. She was soon restored to health. On the previous night, Gandhi had expressed a wish to receive the Kriya Yoga of Lahiri Mohashai. 
I was touched by the Mahatma's open-mindedness and spirit of, of inquiry. He is childlike in his divine quest, revealing that pure receptivity which Jesus praised in children, quote, of such is the kingdom of heaven. The hour for my promised instruction had arrived. Several satyagrahis now entered the room, Mr. Desai, Dr. Pingali, and a few others who desired the Kriya technique. I first taught the little class the physical yogoda exercises. The body is visualized as divided into twenty parts. The will directs energy in turn to each section. Soon everyone was vibrating before me like a human motor. It was easy to observe the rippling effect on Gandhi's twenty body parts at all times completely exposed to view. Though very thin, he is not unpleasingly so. The skin of his body is smooth and unwrinkled. Later I initiated the group into the liberating technique of Kriya Yoga. The Mahatma has reverently studied all world religions, the Jain scriptures, the biblical New Testament, the sociological writings of Tolstoy, are the main sources, the three main sources of Gandhi's non-violent convictions. He has stated his credo thus, quote, I believe the Bible, the Quran, the Zendavesta to be as divinely inspired as the Vedas. I believe in the institution of gurus, but in this age millions must go without a guru, because it is a rare thing to find a combination of perfect purity and perfect learning. But one need not despair of ever knowing the truth of one's religion, because the fundamentals of Hinduism, as of every great religion, are unchangeable and easily understood. I believe like every Hindu in God and his oneness, in rebirth and salvation. I can no more describe my feeling for Hinduism than for my own wife. She moves me as no other woman in the world can. Not that she has no faults. I dare say she has many more than I see myself. But the feeling of an indissoluble bond is there. Even so I feel for and about Hinduism with all its faults and limitations. Nothing delights me so much as the music of the Gita or the Ramayana by Tulsidas. When I fancied I was taking my last breath, the Gita was my solace. Hinduism is not an exclusive religion. In it there is room for the worship of all the prophets of the world. It is not a missionary religion in the ordinary sense of the term. It has no doubt absorbed many tribes in its fold, but this absorption has been of an evolutionary, imperceptible character. Hinduism tells each man to worship God according to his own faith or dharma, and so lives at peace with all religions. End quote. Of Christ, Gandhi has written, I am sure that if, if he were living here now among men, he would bless the lives of many who perhaps have never even heard his name. Just as it is written, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, but he that doeth the will of my Father. In the lesson of his own life, Jesus gave humanity the magnificent purpose and the single objective toward which we all ought to aspire. I believe that he belongs not solely to Christianity, but to the entire world, to all lands and races. On my last evening in Wardha, I addressed the meeting which had been called by Mr. Desai in the town hall. The room was thronged to the window sills with about four hundred people assembled to hear the talk on yoga. I spoke first in Hindi, then in English. Our little group returned to the ashram in time for a good night glimpse of Gandhi, enfolded in peace and correspondence. Night was still lingering when I rose at 5 a.m. Village life was already stirring. First a bullock cart passed by the ashram gates, 
than a peasant with his huge burden balanced precariously on his head. After breakfast, our trio sought out Gandhi for four well pranams. The saint rises at four o'clock for his morning prayer. Mahatmaji, goodbye. I knelt to touch his feet. India is safe in your keeping. Years have rolled by since the Wada idol. The earth, oceans, and skies have darkened with a world at war. Alone among great leaders, Gandhi has offered a practical non-violent alternative to armed might. To redress grievances and remove injustices, the Mahatma Gandhi has employed non-violent means which again and again have proved their effectiveness. He states his doctrine in these words, quote, I have found that life persists in the midst of destruction. Therefore there must be a higher law than that of destruction. Only under that law would well-ordered society be intelligible and life worth living. If that is the law of life, we must work it out in daily existence. Wherever there are wars, wherever we are confronted with an opponent, conquer by love. I have found that the certain law of love has answered in my own life as the law of destruction has never done. In India, we have had an ocular demonstration of the operation of this law on the widest scale possible. I don't claim that non-violence has penetrated the 360 million people in India, but I do claim it has penetrated deeper than any other doctrine in an incredibly short time. It takes a fairly strenuous course of training to attain a mental state of non-violence. It is a disciplined life, like the life of a soldier. The perfect state is reached only when the mind, body, and speech are in proper coordination. Every problem would lend itself to solution if we determined to make the law of truth and non-violence the law of life. Just as a scientist will work wonders out of various applications of the laws of nature, a man who applies the laws of love with scientific precision can work greater wonders. Nonviolence is infinitely more wonderful and subtle than forces of nature, like, for instance, electricity. The law of love is a far greater science than any modern science. End quote. Consulting history, one may reasonably state that the problems of mankind have not been solved by the use of brute force. World War I produced a world-chilling snowball of war karma that swelled into World War II. Only the warmth of brotherhood can melt the present colossal snowball of war karma which may otherwise grow into World War III. This unholy trinity will banish forever the possibility of World War IV by a finality of autumn bombs. Use of jungle logic instead of human reason in settling disputes will restore the earth to a jungle. If brothers not in life, then brothers in violent death. War and crime never pay. The billions of dollars that went up in smoke of explosive nothingness would have been sufficient to have made a new world, one almost free from disease and completely free from poverty. Not an earth of fear, chaos, famine, pestilence, the danse macabre, but one broad land of peace, of prosperity, and of widening knowledge. The non-violent voice of Gandhi appeals to man's highest conscience. Let nations ally themselves no longer with death, but with life, not with destruction, but with construction, not with the annihilator, but with the creator. One should forgive under any injury, says the Mahabharata. Quote again, 
It has been said that the continuation of species is due to man's being forgiving. Forgiveness is holiness. By forgiveness, the universe is held together. Forgiveness is the might of the mighty. Forgiveness is sacrifice. Forgiveness is quiet of mind. Forgiveness and gentleness are the qualities of the self-possessed. They represent eternal virtue. End quote. Nonviolence is the natural outgrowth of the law of forgiveness and love. If loss of life becomes necessary in a righteous battle, Gandhi proclaims, one should be prepared like Jesus to shed his own, not others' blood. Eventually, there will be less blood spilt in the world. Epics shall some day be written on the Indian Satyagrahis, who withstood hate with love, violence with non-violence, who allowed themselves to be mercilessly slaughtered rather than retaliate. The result, on certain historic occasions, was that the armed opponents threw down their guns and fled, shamed, shaken to their depths by the sight of men who valued the life of another above their own. I would wait, if need be, for ages, Gandhi has said, rather than seek the freedom of my country through bloody means, end quote. Never does the Mahatma forget the majestic warning, all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Gandhi has written, quote, I call myself a nationalist, but my nationalism is as broad as the universe. It includes in its sweep all the nations of the earth. My nationalism includes the well-being of the whole world. I do not want my India to rise on the ashes of other nations. I do not want India to exploit a single human being. I want India to be strong in order that she can infect the other nations also with her strength. Not so with a single nation in Europe today. They do not give strength to the others. President Wilson mentioned his beautiful fourteen points, but said, quote, After all, if this endeavor of ours to arrive at peace fails, we have our armaments to fall back upon. End quote. I want to reverse that position, and I say our armaments have failed already. Let us now be in search of something new. Let us try the force of love and God, which is truth. When we have got that, we shall want nothing else. End quote. By the Mahatma's training of thousands of true satyagrahis, those who have taken the eleven rigorous vows mentioned in the first part of this chapter, who in turn spread the message by patiently educating the Indian masses to understand the spiritual and eventually material benefits of non-violence, by arming his people with non-violent weapons, non-cooperation with injustice, the willingness to endure indignities, prison, death itself rather than resort to arms, by enlisting world sympathy through countless examples of heroic martyrdom among satyagrahis, Gandhi has dramatically portrayed the practical nature of non-violence, its solemn power to settle disputes without war. Gandhi has already won through non-violent means a greater number of political concessions for his land than have ever been won by any leader of any country except through bullets. Non-violent methods for eradication of all wrongs and evils have been strikingly applied not only in the political arena but in the delicate and complicated field of Indian social reform. Gandhi and his followers have removed many long-standing feuds between Hindus and Mohammedans. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims took to the Mahatma as their leader. The untouchables have found in him their fearless and triumphant champion. If there be a rebirth in store for me, Gandhi wrote, I wish to be born a pariah in the midst of pariahs, because thereby 
I would be able to render them more effective service. The Mahatma is indeed a great soul, but it was the illiterate millions who had the discernment to bestow the title. This gentle prophet is honored in his own land. The lowly peasant has been able to rise to Gandhi's high challenge. The Mahatma wholeheartedly believes in the inherent nobility of man. The inevitable failures have never disillusioned him. Even if the opponent plays him false twenty times, he wrote, the Satyagrahi is ready to trust him the twenty-first time, for an implicit trust in human nature is the very essence of the creed. Mahatmaji, you are an exceptional man. You must not expect the world to act as you do. A critic once made this observation. It is curious how we delude ourselves, fancying that the body can be improved, but that it is impossible to evoke the hidden powers of the soul, Gandhi replied. I am engaged in trying to show that if I have any of those powers, I am as frail a mortal as any of us, and that I never had anything extraordinary about me, nor have I now. I am a simple individual liable to err like any other fellow mortal. I own, however, that I have enough humility to confess my errors and to retrace my steps. I own that I have an immovable faith in God and His goodness, and an unconsumable passion for truth and love. But is not that what every person has latent in him? If we are to make progress, we must not repeat history, but make new history. We must add to the inheritance left by our ancestors. If we may make new discoveries and inventions in the phenomenal world, must we declare our bankruptcy in the spiritual domain? Is it impossible to multiply the exceptions so as to make the mother rule? Must man always be brute first and man after, if at all? End quote. Americans may well remember with pride the successful non-violent experiment of William Penn in founding his 17th century colony in Pennsylvania. There were no forts, no soldiers, no militia, even no arms. Amidst the savage frontier wars and the butcheries that went on between the new settlers and the Red Indians, the Quakers of Pennsylvania alone remained unmolested. Others were slain, others were massacred, but they were safe. Not a Quaker woman suffered assault. Not a Quaker child was slain. Not a Quaker man was tortured. When the Quakers were finally forced to give up the government of their state, war broke out, and some Pennsylvanians were killed. But only three Quakers were killed, three who had so far fallen from their faith as to carry weapons of defense. Resort to force in the Great War, number one, failed to bring tranquility, Franklin D. Roosevelt has pointed out. Victory and defeat were alike sterile. That lesson the world should have learned. The more weapons of violence, the more misery to mankind, Lao Tzu taught. The triumph of violence ends in a festival of mourning. I am fighting for nothing less than world peace, Gandhi has declared. If the Indian movement is carried to success on a non-violent satyagraha basis, it will give new meaning to patriotism and, if I may say so in all humility, to life itself. Before the West dismisses Gandhi's program as one of an impractical dreamer, let it first reflect on a definition of Satyagraha by the Master of Galilee. Quote, Ye have heard it hath been said, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Gandhi's epoch has extended with the beautiful precision of cosmic timing, into a century already desolated and devastated by two 
world wars. A divine handwriting appears on the granite wall of his life, a warning against the further shedding of blood among brothers.